Hello again and welcome. In this video we're going to be talking about waveguides. About a year ago I was reading a book by Dr. Southworth. He's one of the pioneers of the waveguide. And reading that book stirred some interest. While the light VNA, you can see it was only specified for 50 kilohertz to 6.3 gigahertz. They have a harmonic mode similar to the original nano VNA which allows this to operate all the way up to 9.3 gigahertz. So I was curious if we could use the light VNA to conduct some experiments with waveguides. This article was posted in Popular Electronics. It's titled Microwaves. This was published on June of 1943. And here's a photo of Dr. Southworth. Let me just read a little bit of this article. Research must be done on transmission lines since the ordinary insulating materials fail in the microwave region due to leakage, radiation, stray capacitance, and inductance. Thus, the problem of conducting waves from a generator to an antenna and from an antenna to a receiver assumes an importance unknown in the long waves of the broadcast band and lower frequencies. Ordinary insulated wire is useless here, and even the special transmission methods used for short waves may become hopelessly inefficient. The coaxial line, in which one conductor is a hollow tube and the other conductor is a thin wire supported centrally inside of it, has been one of the best answers to this problem. It goes on to say one of the odd things about microwaves is that if the central conductor is completely removed, it is still possible to transmit energy through the tube, or the outside conductor. In this case, it becomes a waveguide. So that's essentially the definition of a waveguide. So you probably have all seen coax. So again, we have an outside conductor, and then we have an inside conductor. So this provides two electrical connections, where a waveguide will be more like this cardboard tube. Waveguides can either be circular or they can be rectangular. So what's a waveguide look like on the inside? Well, this is a homemade one. I built this just for this demonstration. You can see this is made out of brass. What we have here are three tuning stubs. And here I have a small SMA connector on both sides and just a short piece of wire attached to each one. And when I put this together, there'll be nothing else inside. It's just essentially a hollow tube. So normally with the VNA, we're looking at the incident compared to the reflected signal or essentially how the outgoing signal compares with the incoming signal. You could also be looking at the signal going through a device. So in this case, we're looking at S21. This would be looking at S11. Normally to calibrate an instrument like this, we're gonna use a SOLT or a short open load and a through standard. And these standards are normally provided with the VNA. So in the case of our piece of coax, if we were to connect this to port one of the VNA and we were to short the other side of the cable, as the VNA signal propagates down the end of the cable and it hits this short, 100% of that is going to reflect back and it's going to be out of phase with the original signal. If the end of the coax were open, again the signal as soon as it hits the end of the cable and sees that open, 100% of that signal is going to reflect back and it'll be in phase with the incoming signal. If the source impedance, which is typically going to be 50 ohms, matches our load impedance, which would normally be 50 ohms, then all the energy is going to be dissipated by the 50 ohm load and nothing's going to be reflected back. A waveguide doesn't really work like that. Again, going back to our cardboard tube, let's say I take a flashlight and I shine it down this tube. What's going to happen once the light hits the end of the tube? It's an open. Is it going to reflect back like what happens with our coax? No, nope, it's not. So we have some differences in how these two systems behave. Let's say the end of this tube was open. So this piece of material here has been removed and we have our source down on this end of the line. Again, if the end of this is capped off or shorted, all the signal is gonna be reflected back. Think about it, it has nowhere else to go. So the short on the piece of our coax works similar to what it does with a waveguide. But again, if we were to open this up, very little of the signal is going to be reflected back. Now, of course, with a waveguide, we can have something called a load. And essentially, you could think of that as almost having the tube here opened up on the end. 
all the energy is going to be dissipated out here somewhere. Now, that's not entirely true, right? Some of that energy is going to be reflected back, but let's ignore that for now. There are loads that can be used with the waveguides, and essentially what it is is a piece of absorbing material that's placed inside of the waveguide. So with our waveguide, we have the concept of a load and a short, but what do we do with the open? So if we're looking at our Smith chart, here's our 50 ohm center, here's our short, and here's our open. One way to do this is to basically add a phase delay to the tube. And how do we do that? We change the length of the tube. Let's say this were a precision piece of waveguide. And let's say the end of this waveguide is our calibrated short standard. What we can do is we can move the location of this. So we do that with something that's called a step load. So if you look at CAL standards for waveguides, a step load is something that's going to be normally included with that set and again that's providing you with this known phase offset. So if you're like me one of the first questions you probably have is how do I come up with the dimensions for this? So let's start by looking at the light VNA. Again we know that that's rated between 50 kilohertz and 6.3 gigahertz so that's going to be the operating range. Again it does provide this harmonic mode that allows us to operate all the way up to 9.3 gigahertz if you go out online and you do a search for waveguide dimensions, you'll find various tables where they've defined all that for you. So this would be one of the standards. This is WR284. WR stands for waveguide. R is rectangular. You could have a circular waveguide as well. And this 284 defines the geometry. In this case, our waveguide is 72.14 millimeters by 34.04. That gives us an operating range of roughly 2.6 to 3.95 gigahertz. If we look at the wavelength of the center frequency, it's roughly 91.54 millimeters. So if we look at the width of the waveguide, that is going to be typically three quarters of the wavelength or 0.75 times 91.54 millimeters. And that's where we get this 72.14. And if we look at the height, that's going to be roughly 3 eighths of the wavelength and that's where the 34.04 comes from. Another way that we can look at this is the height is basically one half of the width. Now, of course we have our SMA connectors on the end. The location of these is important as well. Imagine this is our tube and down here is our SMA connector with our little pin coming up. The height of this is essentially one half H. So we take the 34.04 millimeters, divide that by two, and that's the height of this pin. The distance from this to the back side, D, is going to be equal to one quarter of the wavelength. So in that case, our wavelength is 91.54 millimeters. We're going to divide that by four, and that gives us a distance of 23.28 millimeters. Just like our piece of coax, the overall length of this really is an important now again, we do have these tuning stubs. You can see these are adjusted to be flush with the edge of the waveguide. Imagine our screws going through the back side of the waveguide, opposite of our little stub here. Each one spaced one eighth of a wavelength away. So this hobby brass just came from a local hardware store. And unfortunately, they don't sell it in the size sheet that we need to actually build this WR284 waveguide. These sheets come in 10 by 4 inches and again as we said our 10 inches or our length of the waveguide doesn't really matter so we're fine with the 10 inches but our 4 inches we actually need 4.18 inches so we're just shy by 0.18 inches that'll give us a new width and height of 69.85 millimeters by 31.75 Again, we said the width is three quarters of a wavelength. So if we take our 69.85 divided by 0.75, so that gives us a center frequency of 3.22 gigahertz. So one of the things about this waveguide, again, is you can see this little stub, it doesn't go anywhere. So this is an open. Now it's possible that you can make a transition that's shorted Typically, instead of a 90 degree launch, like what I've shown here, it'll come out in line like this. And here's our stub, and then this will short off to the case. 
there's advantages and disadvantages to each of these techniques. Just depends what you're after. One of the things to consider with this being an open is let's say we have a circuit that we're putting a DC bias on. Well, there's no need for putting in a blocking cap. We already have it. So if we look at the frequency response of this waveguide, again with our light VNA we can sweep between 50 kilohertz and 6.2 gigahertz. Well, the center frequency of our waveguide is 3.2 gigahertz. So let's say right basically in the center of where the light VNA can operate, down here at 50 kilohertz, it's an open. So nothing's going to pass through. So if you're wanting to build a high pass filter with very good low frequency rejection, the waveguide is probably a candidate. Again, it won't pass DC. So while we have this waveguide apart, I'd like to run a couple experiments with it. So you can see I have our Nano VNA software running. We'll just go ahead and link to the VNA. And let's perform a calibration. So we'll do two port cal. We'll select old. And we'll go to calibrations. And what do we have here? We're going to use this 300 kilohertz to 6 gigahertz. And you can see the unit's now calibrated. Let's go ahead and perform a sweep. You can see it's an open right now. It's not quite calibrated. Of course, we don't have a load attached. But let's go to transmission. And you can see it's essentially an open. So the noise floor in this VNA is somewhere around 70 or so at the lower frequencies and maybe 50 or so at the higher end. So let's go ahead and we'll save this for now. Now you can imagine if I were to take our little piece of test coax and attach that to the two ports, essentially we're going to get a flat line at 0 dB, no different than if we installed our little through here. But what happens if we connect this up to our piece of waveguide? I think the amateur radio guys are looking at this and they're seeing, well, here's our ground plane. And I have two vertical antennas, so isn't it just going to radiate between the two? Well, it probably will. Let's have a look. Again, I should be clear. I am not a ham radio operator or a CB operator. And here we can see there is definitely something going on right here at about 2 gigahertz. You can see how the signal is definitely starting to pass between the two. What we could do is just uh, turn off the cal. We can do that by selecting two port cal. Let's just hit cancel. We'll turn off our memory. And let's pump this up to 9 gig. Now what's happening in this area over here is the light VNA just has a lot of leakage. And again, we're using the harmonic mode. I've said before, maybe 8 gigahertz is roughly where you can use this device at. You start getting up around 9 gig or 9.3 where they cap it. The performance is pretty poor. But let's forget about that for now. Let's just go ahead and we'll save this to the memory. And now what happens if we start to close this up? You can see this edge now is much more pronounced. Again, that's right in this region here, roughly 2 gigahertz. So one of the problems is we haven't yet soldered this material together. So I think that's the next thing we're going to do. To solder this case together, we've got to bring out some manly solder. This would be normally what I'm using for surface mount. Of course it contains lead. Now I've already soldered the seams in the corners. You can see this material is quite flimsy. This has a wall thickness of 10 thousandths. So what I'm going to do is basically lay this lip on top of this and that will help straighten this piece out. So. And we don't need a big bead, just enough to hold it in place. And let's work our way over to this corner here. That looks pretty good right about there. Give it a little tack here in the middle. And then again we'll go down to the far edge here. 
roughly right about there. Get this corner. Now you can see here and here it's a little bit of a lip. What I'm going to do is just take our X-Acto knife and we'll just slide this between the two and we can pull this up. Try to get that flush. And we'll just add a tack right here. Looks pretty good. A little bit of a lip right here. Let's just loosen this joint up. And then we can re-tack it. And maybe tack it right here. So I've been looking at eBay for used prices on waveguides and unfortunately a lot of that is still outside of what the hobbyist probably could afford. And the sad thing is, is a lot of it looks like total junk. So one of the things I was looking for was, of course, coax to waveguide transitions. And I've seen one that was, I think, $130 or something. Very expensive, but it, that thing was just beat to a pulp. It's like, I, I don't even know what you would do with it. Maybe the casting was good if you reground the end of it or something. But <laughs> there's no way I would give them 135 bucks for it. I wouldn't even give them 35 bucks for it. But to find uh, good waveguide pieces at a, at a reasonable price seems to be the biggest challenge with these experiments. So that's why I'm choosing to build a lot of my own for these experiments. This is stuff that you could just go to the store and buy. The amount of brass that I'm using here, these two sheets combined was about $10. Little brass screws and brass nuts here. You know, maybe another couple of bucks. The connectors are the most expensive thing that you're seeing me use. Again, we just want to make sure that nothing is going to move when we actually run a bead down this. It's pretty sturdy right there. So now let's go ahead and we'll run a bead down this. Once I kind of get the solder laid up in here, what I'm going to do is just run a second pass with the soldering iron and we'll reflow this whole thing and that will smooth out all these joints see we now have a continuous bead going all the way around this everything's nice and straight See that's made everything very rigid. Just add a little bit of heat. And we'll just drag the iron right along the edge. We'll do that to the other edge as well. Tour. Again, it doesn't take a lot. You can see kind of what I'm going for. A nice seal along that whole edge. 
And there we have it. Our completed waveguide. So before we test our homemade waveguide, there's a couple of things I'd like to go over. One of them is this bend. Where I solder it together, I get a very sharp edge. But where I'm bending it, you can see there's a small radii. There's a guideline for the acceptable bend radii. It has to be less than 10% of the width, or the broad width. This direction here. The other thing I'd like to go over is the cutoff frequency for the waveguide. Now again, these ports are in open, so obviously it can't pass DC. So for our waveguide, we're going to take 2 times the width, or 2 times 69.85, divide it into 299.79 millimeters per nanosecond, and that's going to equal 2.146 gigahertz. When we talk about the mode, if you think about these being the cross section of the waveguide, A being the width, in mode 1-0, you'd have a half cycle. Mode 2-0, we get a complete cycle. And then mode 3-0, we get three half cycles. So again, the mode is the number of half sign variations. So normally for, again, WR248, which this is pretty close to, the lowest mode is 2.078. That's the low frequency cutoff. As we go to the next mode, it's going to be at 4.156 gigahertz. So that's what's going to happen as we go to these higher frequencies. We're changing the mode that we're using the waveguide at. So this is my old Agilent. This is an 8357A. This VNA originally had a range of 300 kilohertz to 6 gigahertz. Agilent used to sell an option for this VNA that allowed you to increase the range to 9 gigahertz. Of course, this VNA is very old, and of course, they no longer support it. So a member up on EEB blog hacked the codes for this. So this VNA now has those codes entered, and it does operate all the way up to 9 gigahertz. One of the advantages of having this network analyzer running at 9 gigahertz is it provides us with a sanity check for the light VNA. Again, the light VNA can run all the way up to 9.3 gigahertz using the harmonic mode. So I have to change some of the cabling on this to take some measurements. I'll go ahead and set all that up. Once I have that data, we can get started making the measurements with the light VNA. One of the things I should mention is before I took the measurements with the Agilent VNA, I went ahead and locked down all these adjustment screws. Now because they may not be the same between the two ports, what I've done is I've marked where I had this hooked up to the Agilent. So port 1 went to this SMA, and port 2 went to this SMA. And this is waveguide number one that we'll be looking at. One of the things I should mention too is when I use the light VNA, I'm using a set of standards that were supplied with V2 plus 4. They are slightly modified. You can see the short has a nut that I've soldered to the back of this. That allows me to torque this thing without actually turning the center pin. I purchased eight loads from mini circuits and then I sorted these on my Agilent VNA comparing them against a set of Agilent standards. And this happens to be the second best one for return loss. So that's what I'm using for my load standard here. And the reason I mention that is I'm using different standards to calibrate the Agilent VNA, as well as I'm using different models. So just keep that in mind as we're comparing data between the two VNAs. There are going to be some subtle differences between the two measurements. So again, we set our cutoff frequency for this waveguide should be roughly 2.146 gigahertz. So what I've done with the Agilent is I've swept it between 1 and 5 gigahertz. And that should give us plenty of data to look at the profile of this. So again, we'll be attaching port 1 of the light VNA to port 1 of our waveguide. Again, we just want to keep everything as close to the same as possible. That includes torquing all the connectors. Alright, let's have a look here. We'll change to transmission rectangular. Now, of course, the VNA has not been calibrated yet. Let's go ahead and do that. So we'll go to port cal, old, and we select right here, 1 gig to 5 gig, 1 port salt, WR284. You see it doesn't really change a whole lot. Let's grab cursor A. And you can see right here, this is 2.15 gig. Here's 
and so very close to what we had calculated at 2.146 so what we can do now is just go ahead and save this to a touchstone file and let's compare this data against the Agilent so this is the data that we just collected and here's the data that we collected with the PNA again very similar to one another a little bit of disturbance up in here one of the things you can see with the PNA it has a much lower noise floor you can see we're measuring down here at close to 90 dB versus just shy of 70 dB so as we talk about the noise floor for these different VNAs here's some data that I've collected this tan one at the bottom this is our PNA you can see the noise floor on it up to about 3 gigahertz is below about 110 dB all the way up to 9 gigahertz the worst case it's about 90 dB one of the owners of the Libre VNA provided this data this is the black trace the upper frequency limit of that VNA is 6 gigahertz the next one is our light VNA again we're sweeping all the way up to 9 gigahertz this step here is caused when we change over to harmonic mode the green trace is the V2 plus 4 the yellow trace is the V2 plus instead of the V2 plus 4 so this has the smaller screen and finally the red trace here with the highest noise this is the original nano VNA it's interesting again about this you can see at these very low frequencies it actually performs as well if not better than the light VNA of course when we're experimenting with these waveguides we're working in excess of 6 gigahertz so we're way out in this area here where you can see the light VNA's noise gets really bad this is minus 20 dB down so it's going to be very difficult to make measurements with that at the higher frequencies but again we have the Agilent PNA that we can use as kind of a sanity check for any measurements that we make with the light VNA of course trying to make anything with this size waveguide could be a bit of a problem and that's one of my last notes that I'd made here larger waveguides work at lower frequencies this is a newspaper article from amateur this was dated in December of 1949 and it's talking about cavity resonators and this is just after World War II it says here since the war with information being released gradually by the authorities large numbers of radio men apparently have been catching up on the reading so they're reading about waveguide technologies for some unexplained reason, the author's mail lately has included a respectable number of requests for the dimensions of cavity resonators for use in transmitters and frequency measurement gear in the amateur 1, 2, and 6 meter bands. Explanation mark. <laughs> we have advised the inquirers that the cavity for even a 1 meter band is a cumbersome thing. The amateur responds, all right, tell me the exact size, I still want to know. <laughs> So, in conclusion down here, we do not believe that any amateurs are interested in anything but simplest shapes, cylindrical, can, cube, box, and sphere. We also doubt that anyone will be honestly interested in a 6 meter cavity, since it would have to be as big as a room. So for our next experiment, I'd like to work with a smaller waveguide than this. Again, this standard basically was a WR-284. So looking through the industry standards and just seeing what's kind of available and what could actually work with the light VNA, there's another standard called WR90. Again, WR standing for Waveguide Rectangular. So the WR90 Waveguide has an inner dimension of 22.86 by 10.16 millimeters. It has a recommended operating range of 8.2 to 12.4 gigahertz. So the wavelength on this is 29.68 millimeters. The low frequency cutoff for the WR90 is 6.557 and the upper cutoff is 13.114 gigahertz. Again, that's where it's transitioning from mode 1.0 to mode 2.0. And just an FYI, this is known as the X-band. Now again, the Nano VNA can work all the way up to 9.3 gigahertz. So at first glance, it would appear that we could use the light VNA to experiment with the WR90 waveguides. One of the benefits with this is it's a common standard, and if you look out on eBay, and if you do some searches on the internet, you'll find different salvage yards that offer WR90 waveguides. So they're readily available. I wouldn't say that they're low cost, but maybe you can find a deal on them. I haven't so far. 
That's why I made this waveguide out of brass from the local Ace Hardware store. So this is my very first WR90 waveguide. Actually it started out with these two transitions were attached together. This is all made out of circuit board material and they're just soldered together. This is what it looks like down inside. And this is basically constructed the same way that our larger waveguide was. So again we're looking at the height of our coax inside of the waveguide being roughly half the height or about five millimeters and the distance D from the coax to the back is one quarter of a wavelength and again we said the wavelength for this waveguide is 29.68 so divide that by four so again this started out very similar to this waveguide where I just had the two transitions in our section of waveguide material here and I ran some sweeps with that then I cut it in half and then I just pointed the two waveguides at each other and I took some measurements that way and then I mounted one of these to my 3D rotor and then I did a three-dimensional sweep of it. Then finally what I did is I added this horn and then I swept it again and we could see how it changed the gain of our antenna pattern by adding the horn. The effects were pretty dramatic. So another experiment I made a second horn and then I coated this one with this sheet of fiberglass basically to show how this affected the radiation pattern of the horn and basically it was a wash like you would expect. Of course if you look at a lot of microwave antennas that are outside they'll have covers on them to protect them from the elements. Alright so here I have our network analyzer attached to the two antennas. Port 1 going to the antenna on the right, port 2 to the antenna on the left and you can see we're still sweeping between 1 and 5 gigahertz and of course you notice that nothing's really coupling between the two but again we said the low cutoff frequency for this type of waveguide is going to be six and a half gigahertz so we're a little outside of the range for these so let's go ahead and change the frequency we'll load this calibration here so this is sweeping between seven and nine gigahertz and look at that so very close to maybe seven db at the worst case let's just go ahead and we'll change this to CW mode we'll select 7 gigahertz we'll change it to the axis mode so you can see it's 7 gigahertz even it's got about 2.5 dB a loss now let's go ahead and select the max hold now watch what happens as I rotate one of the horns 90 degrees See how the signal drops all the way to, I don't know, 35 dB or so. Again, the RF wave is polarized. It is an electromagnetic waveform. So if we kind of, again, think about it, we have the E in one axis and the M in the other. One going this way, the other going this way. If you were to look down the barrel of this thing, and we're looking at it head on, you would notice a circular pattern on this. Basically what we've done by flipping the horn is we've changed the EMM. This is a polarizer. All this is is two blocks of wood with a lot of holes drilled in it. And then this is aluminum wire that I've just press fit into the holes. Electrically none of these are attached to each other. So watch what happens as I put these between the two antennas. You can see it has no effect. Now watch what happens as I rotate this 90 degrees. See how it cuts off the signal. We're down at about 18 dB or so. It's actually a pretty good video on this on YouTube. It was a professor that was talking about how he had taught this class all wrong since he had been teaching it. So it's a pretty good explanation on how polarizers work. So I'll provide a link for that in the description if you're interested. Anyway, the whole idea is showing you this is that, again, we're working with higher frequency waveguides now, essentially a WR90, and we're able to do that with the light VNA and actually get some meaningful data. And so far what you've seen with these demonstrations, I've spent about $20 maybe. So playing with the waveguides doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Just keep that in mind. So I've shown you what a waveguide looks like, how we transition from coax to the waveguide, and then I've shown you that we can make an antenna out of it as well, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. So let's try making our first circuit. I found some software online, this is called WGFIL6, and this is version 1-3.
and this is a post filter calculator. Essentially what we've got here is our WR90 waveguide and here's our transitions so there's an SMA here an SMA here again they have a stub attached to these that goes up half the height of the waveguide and then I have some posts so there's a post here 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 and here and these are soldered to both sides of the circuit board and then I have some tuning stubs attached to the top side and these are the same type of a tuning stub that you see on our first waveguide so with this software where we can design different filters this one is a chubby shove I set up the software for a 0.1 dB ripple it's a three element filter and it has a 8 gigahertz center frequency with a 100 megahertz bandwidth and then I programmed in our post size for the first post of 1 32nd of an inch and then for the larger post I've used 1 8th of an inch and the software comes back with these numbers which is the spacing for our posts so that is what this filter is again because this is with inside of our 9.3 gigahertz let's try to measure this with our light VNA so just like before with our first waveguide I've gone ahead and characterized this on our Agilent PNA first you can also see I've locked down these tuning stubs I did that prior to taking my measurements with it basically you can almost consider this a quasi standard unfortunately I don't have a lot of waveguide parts sitting around here obviously yeah, it's very important that we torque everything the same just try to eliminate as many variables as possible we're going to select this 300k to 9 gigahertz and right here you can see our filter now what we can do is move the cursors to the peak you can see the frequency is roughly 8.123 gigahertz and what do we say our center frequency was 8 gigahertz is what we were looking for one of the things about this filter is it looks kind of rounded again we said that we were looking for 100 megahertz bandwidth let me just go ahead we'll save this off to a touchstone file and then we're going to load up a separate calibration and we're going to select this 7 gigahertz to 9 gigahertz SOLT WR90 and let's have a look at our 3 dB points so again we just select cursor minus 3 dB we can see our bandwidth is about 137 megahertz versus what we said here at 100 megahertz it's actually fairly close but what I've done with this filter is I have purposely tuned it to the high side and I'll show you why in just a second so again let's bring up our meta software so as you can see between 300 kilohertz and 3 gigahertz the two VNAs are fairly closely matched once we start moving above 3 gigahertz, the noise floor of the light VNA gets pretty bad. Now up here around the peak, and notice how that really affects us up where the peak is. Of course our PNA has a much lower noise floor, so we're able to get a better idea what that skirt looks like. Of course the noise floor of the light VNA just continues on up, so as we operate at higher and higher frequencies, we won't be able to see anything. And remember me saying that I wasn't really looking for flatness with this filter? that I ended up pushing it to get the peak at a higher frequency and that's the reason I did that was to show you that the higher the frequencies are that we're operating this light VNA the more difficult it's going to be to make a good measurement with it remember I ran a sweep between 7 gigahertz and 9 gigahertz as well you'll notice that there's a little bit of offset in the amplitude as well as there's a phase shift again I want to be very clear that I'm using these very low cost calibration standards for this and I'm using the ideal model so there's a lot of errors between these two setups right now but I'm actually quite surprised that we're able to see anything I mean you can tell that this filter is basically doing what it was intended to if we look off to the left you'll see there was also a waveguide 3 this is it right here this is tuned for a center frequency of 8.083 gigahertz this filter is basically identical to this one on the left the only difference between these two is that I've moved our coaxial transition back one wavelength 
on both sides normally that's what you would do with this now it's interesting is it didn't really make any difference in how the filter performs now one thing that I did do with this one is I tried to tune this to basically get a nice flat response now, this filter is made out of brass or again this one is just made up of circuit board sections that have been soldered together I believe that this is 32 thousandths thick it's about double the thickness of that first waveguide that we made and of course it has a more dramatic radii here but again a very sharp edge where we soldered the two together again keeping in mind that the internal radii has to be less than 10 percent of the width of the waveguide so let me just show you the data for this filter again this is sweeping between 300 kilohertz and 9 gigahertz this is with our Agilent and this is what it looks like sweeping between 7.9 gig and 9 gigahertz again the red being the Agilent and the black being the light being A if we go ahead and hook filter number 3 back up and again let's go ahead and move the cursors to the minus 3 dB points we can see this filter has a width of 172 and a half megahertz but notice how it's a lot more flat it's got this little bit of a ripple here in the top let's go ahead and enable the max hold and now what I'm going to do is change the IF bandwidth we'll just go down one click so again we're working above 100 megahertz so this is a 2 kilohertz IF bandwidth let's try selecting a 1 kilohertz IF bandwidth you can see it is bringing the noise floor down slightly let's go ahead and we'll just change this back and now let's enable the averages we'll just run 10 averages total for now so I'd say it's starting to look pretty questionable if we can use the light VNA to really even do anything with these waveguides at these kinds of frequencies I've got a second one of these light VNAs that a friend of mine, Flipper, had given to me. That one actually had worse noise than this one. And that's when I had discovered that most of the noise problems stem from the fact that the designers of the VNA didn't consider the supply voltage from the USB port. So what I did is I made a cable that has a diode in series with the power for the VNA. And that greatly improved his noise floor. As a matter of fact, it was on par with what this VNA is. So since I've had that VNA, I've attempted to improve its noise floor. One of the things I did is I removed the TBS diodes on the front end, and then I changed the whole bypass. If you look inside of these, there's an electrolytic up on one corner of the board. What I did is I removed that, and then I sprinkled, essentially, a lot of tantalum caps across the circuit boards. That actually helped quite a bit. The only thing I did is I took the IF amplifier and I upped the gain. There's obviously a limit how far you can go with that, but I did get some performance gains with that as well. So that VNA will actually outperform this one as far as the noise. Most of it is evident down at the lower frequencies. So the gist of me bringing that up is I don't think that we could modify the light VNA to improve its performance enough to do these experiments with these higher frequency waveguides. So we're going to need another solution and again the people developing the firmware for this have capped it at 9.3 gigahertz for good reason but we'd like to run experiments beyond 9.3 gigahertz anyway and unfortunately even my Agilent PNA can't run beyond 9 gigahertz so we're really kind of stuck with this problem now this is my V2 plus 4 the people that designed this had told me at one point that this is basically the predecessor to the light VNA and the people that developed this it essentially copied this design and then they had swapped out some of the components to improve the performance of this to get that higher frequency so the person that's doing the firmware for this light VNA is a member by the name of Dislord a lot of you probably know who he is and he's really done a great job supporting the firmware for this as far as I'm concerned I've found very little problems and the small ones that I've come across He's been willing to work with me to improve those. This one, on the other hand, we're pretty much locked out of it. And so we get what we get. And it's possible that this may support harmonic modes to allow us to run up to higher frequencies. But since I've received this light VNA, I really haven't used the V2 Plus 4. As a matter of fact, yep, the battery's dead. It's drained down. 
But if you owned one of these, I guess the question is, is could this be used to make these experiments as well? Certainly for this lower frequency waveguide, we definitely could because this operates with inside the range of the B2 plus 4, but not these higher frequency waveguides. Again, if we look at the noise for these VMAs, let's just say we're starting off at 50 kilohertz and we can run up to 9.3 gig. Noise actually starts out pretty good. I don't know, it's like minus 70 dB or something. Very acceptable. Again, it gets to about 3 gigahertz or so. And we can see the noise floor starting to go up at 9.3. I don't know, what would we say, minus 20 dB or something? It's not very good. So the question is, is could we use this range to test these waveguides? So I'm going to show you how we could probably do that. Some time ago there was a contest up on the EV blog and what we were trying to do was build the world's fastest oscillator on a breadboard. This was my entry for it and as far as I know this is still the record holder. And unfortunately as I was developing this the problem that I ran into is of course I'm limited by the test equipment that I have available and that ended up being my limitation as far as going any faster with this. I would bought some faster transistors to kind of hedge my bets. But uh, yeah, I, I never even did anything with them. The problem, again, I've got no way to measure it. So that stopped my fun and games with this. But one of the things that I had shown as I was developing this, uh, one of the criteria was they wanted to see what the output of this looked like with some other thing like an oscilloscope. Of course, you know, I don't have an oscilloscope that can look at a 25 gigahertz waveform. The fastest oscilloscopes I have are my old LaCroix 7200. We're talking about the one that was built in the 80s with the BME chassis. That's got a bandwidth of 4 gigahertz. And then I have a newer WaveMaster, newer being 20 years old or something now. But that's got a bandwidth of 5 gigahertz. Nothing even close to being fast enough to look at an oscillator like this. So as I was developing these, one of the things I had done is I kind of went to my basic radio theory and I was using a down converter so essentially what I did is I took the signal coming out of our oscillator and I ran that into a mixer and so you know here's my LO at uh, 12 gig and of course we're mixing this so we're getting plus and minus sidebands as we're doing that mixing I ran this through a filter to get me the one sideband that I'm looking for fed it through an amplifier and then into my oscilloscope so using this setup, I could use my spectrum analyzer as well as my oscilloscope to look at signals much faster than what those were designed for. So again, the VNA has two ports, port 1 and port 2. And we're looking at filters, so we want to measure S21. So what we could do is take the output of this VNA, we could mix that with our LO, and we could upconvert this signal. So if this is down in our sweet spot down here so say 0 to 3 gigahertz and if we put out a 3 gigahertz signal for a local oscillator then if we look at our output here we can get a signal between 3 and 6 gigahertz now of course we have to run this through a filter and that'll be a high pass because we want to look at the upper side band and we'll probably have to amplify this and now this becomes our new port one we'll call it E for extended so for port 2 we have to do the same thing. We take the signal in, we feed that through another mixer, and this ties to port 2 of the VNA. These two mixers operate at the same IF frequency, and we probably have some attenuator sitting on the front side of this to help with the match of the front end of the mixer. This is called a frequency extender, and there are companies that produce products that do exactly this. Normally you'll see them with waveguide outputs on them because people are trying to work way higher frequencies than what we're trying to do here <laughs> for the real RF guys. This is going to be essentially DC. But again, for home hobby use uh, with the availability of these parts, if you're just wanting to experiment, I think this is going to be a good choice. So this is what I've come up with. It has an extended frequency of 8 to 12 gigahertz. Again, this is known as the X-band. Just like the VNA, this gives me an output power of roughly 0 dBm. We start out with a DRO, or a dielectric resonant oscillator. This particular one is phase locked to a 10 MHz reference oscillator. And again, in my case, that reference becomes the GPS receiver. 
The output of the oscillator runs to a splitter. That splitter then drives the local oscillator of our two mixers. So the VNA's port 1, or its output, is going to connect to this port here. That runs through a low-pass filter. It gets mixed with our LO. That produces our RF output, which then runs through a small image rejection filter, passed through a high-frequency amplifier, and then this output here becomes our extended port 1. So to use our VNA with this, we limit our output frequency between 40 megahertz, and that's a limitation of our mixers. Those can work down to 30 megahertz. And then the top end is 4 gigahertz. And again, that 4 gigahertz is a limitation of the mixer. Those work with an IF frequency from DC up to 4 gigahertz. This then becomes our new extended port 2. Again, that feeds into the RF input of our second mixer. But it goes through an attenuator. Again, this is to help with our port matching. And again, that gets mixed with the local oscillator. Developing our IF frequency here which then goes through an IF amplifier, through another filter, and then back to port 2 of the VNA. Again, the whole idea with this is it's allowing us to use these low-cost VNAs in an area where they have fairly decent noise performance. And we're basically moving this band up into a higher frequency range where we can now work with these waveguides. And again, we can do this fairly low cost. These are all available for mini circuits. You can find these DROs up on eBay. You'll normally pay about $100 each for these. Again, these DROs typically put out between like 12, 13 dB. You're gonna lose three dB through the splitter. And these mixers will operate all the way down to seven dB, but the performance really starts to suffer. You really wanna operate these closer to what the data sheets recommend. So at the top of the screen here, you can see our light VNA, port one going to port one of our extender, and port two going to port two of the extender. We have these two green cables. This would be our extended port one and our extended port two. Now to calibrate this system, and we're normalizing the data, it's unfortunately about the best I'm gonna be able to do with this. So let's just go ahead and we'll attach our filter. And we'll go ahead and torque this. And this is what it looks like. So let's just fire up Metis real quick. This is the original data that we collected with the light VNA without the extender. Again, it starts out with a fairly low noise at about three gigahertz. You can see it starts to increase. And as we work our way up to eight gigahertz where our filter kicks in, our noise gets up to about 30 dB and then the falling skirt of the filter we're all the way up to about 20 dB. Let's just compare that with the data off of the extender. And you can see now the skirt's very similar. It's 7.9 gigahertz. Using the extender you can see that the noise floor is actually lower than what it was without it. You also notice that we have a little bit better response here in this area around 8 gigahertz and now look at the trailing edge it now falls far below where the noise floor was of the VNA now let's go ahead and compare that with the data that we collected with the PNA you can see the rising skirt is basically right on top of each other something goes on here is a little bit of a phase difference of course down this area here we can see the light is starting to have a little bit of waver to it now, I made a change, and you can see I've added another attenuator on the output of our amplifier. So without this attenuator, I'm afraid that the port match on our filter isn't very good. And I think that's causing a lot of our ripple. So adding this attenuator helps settle that down. Unfortunately, we've lost some of the dynamic range. I really think this whole system could be optimized to greatly improve it. The first time I ran this experiment, I used the YIG oscillator and I ran it at a lower frequency than what I'm running in this DRO. So that does a couple of things for me. One, it eases up on the requirements for this filter that I've got here. Again, this is a pretty low grade filter for what we're trying to use it for. The other thing that it did for me is it allowed me to operate down at a lower frequency. But even with this built the way it is right now, we've definitely improved the performance of the light VNA. So this is the last thing I'd like to show you for this video.
This is another filter that I made up. Notice that this one doesn't have any tuning stubs on it. Also notice that the spacing between these posts, it's a lot tighter. Also notice that the very first post is a lot thicker than the first post on this filter. So this filter is supposed to have a center frequency of around 10 gigahertz. I don't have any way to verify that because the PNA will only run up to 9 gigahertz. So let's just go ahead and attach this to our extender. So here you can see we're sweeping between 9.5 gigahertz and 11 gigahertz or so. And it's definitely a filter. You can see it's fairly wide. Looks like our bandwidth is roughly 1 gigahertz and the center frequency is very close to 10 gigahertz. It looks like 10.2. Well, I think that's going to be it for this video. I didn't want to cut it short without demonstrating this extender. So I know we've covered a lot of material. I'm probably going to make a second video where we go over some more experiments. So if you have any questions or suggestions that you'd like to see in that second video, just feel free to post your comments. You can also join me up on the EEV blog. I'll provide a link to the thread where I'm posting details about these experiments. So if you want to follow me up there, you're more than welcome to. Well, that's all for now. Hope to see you in the next video. Later.